This is Nick Asayan, CEO of Light Helmets, and uh, we are here on the version of Light Impact, Season 1, Episode 4. very good friend of mine is sitting with me. Our guest today was in the SEAL teams for 10 years and uh, was injured. We're going to talk a little bit about that. He's recovered fully and then some. That's still a little ugly. <laughs> uh, he owns a company called Half Face Blades, which you may have heard of, that makes stellar knives. We're going to talk a little bit about his business and some of the trials and tribulations in getting there. Also involved in Kill Bad Dudes and the Canoe Club. Uh, again, one of my very good friends, Andrew Arabito. Thanks so much for being here today. Appreciate you uh, coming in. Absolutely, buddy. Anytime. Stoked to be here. We uh, will disclose in advance that Andrew does own a part of Light Helmets and was one of the original founders of, of the company, um, along with another team guy, Mike Moriarty. And what what got you to even decide to jump into this? Was it was you, it your love for me? Yeah. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> hey, man, this is going to be awesome. You explained what it was, how you're going to change the game, and how you're going to help uh, – help players uh, with the injuries, and I was like, well, what, uh, the timing was a little bad because of COVID, but I believed in it, so I was he- all in. No, I appreciate your uh, confidence in all of this, and when you were working, when you were in the Navy, you were using some of these materials, I mean, when you the go... Kevlar and stuff, yep, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many times did it save your ass? Well, I never got shot in the head, even though it probably looks like it by looking at my <laughs> face, but uh, I, I would have... Probably done better had I had a face mask on the helmets in the military and not smashed my face. The new fast. ones, some of the guys are wearing it, aren't they? I, don't I would hope not. Yeah. I've seen those, but I think those are more for looks than any of the guys in the SEAL teams wearing them. Yeah. They have that like full weird motorcycle looking face. There. That's right. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a motorcycle thing. Yeah. So let's rewind. Um, tell me and tell everybody else, you know, where did you grow up? A uh, little bit about your, your family and, and what your life was like early on. I um, grew up in northern Napa Valley, right above St. Helena. Those are like St. Helena, Calistoga, the upper towns there. Were you sucking uh, wine at, as, at like age no, two or three? No, I, I wish, because um, I'm doing that now. I, I started Warpaw Wines, too. Forgot you know, about Last year, a little wine company with some with a buddy up there. But uh, anyway, grew up up there in Napa Valley, up on the hill above St. Helena, a little tiny small town uh, in the woods. Grew up a poor, smelly kid in school, but I didn't know it, because... <laughs> I was smelly, and you can't smell yourself, so. Um, grew up in the woods out there running around. I had older brothers, my sister, a real outdoor family. Used to travel a lot, camp, camping, uh, backpacking, everything outdoors. Brothers, how much older, sister, what were they? Um, so my brothers were, I guess when I was seven, they were 13 and 11, and my sister was nine. And what did your parents do work-wise? Uh, my dad was a minister and an artist. He was a pastor of a, a church, I think, up there somewhere, and then he traveled around and did uh, kind of religious history stuff, and he worked on religious history documentaries. Uh, we travel around the world and uh, just get information together and, and write it down, take pictures. And your mom, what was her story? Uh, she grew up actually up there, part of her life up there in Napa Valley. Her father was the business manager of the college in the small town wow. I lived in, but she graduated from, from the college there, and she went off... Uh, and traveled around the world, lived in Korea, and did mission work, and then met my dad, married him, and uh, started pumping out kids, so she just became a, a stay-at-home mom. <laughs> <laughs> so diplomatically. So uh, you lost your father and your brothers in an airplane crash. Can you share a little bit about that, and you guys were going to go on a trip? somewhere and yeah, my dad had been back and forth from Alaska we have friends up there um, there was a small village out in the middle of nowhere uh, along the coast the uh, western coast up there in Alaska that was the people are living to be you know 20 25 years longer in that one village than the other villages um, and I don't know how he had heard about it but the, our family friends that lived up there have planes and they would fly in and help these villages out and do a little medical work and and uh, they must have told him. So he was like, man, what a cool documentary that'd be, and go find out why. Why is this one village living longer? So he was up there, and this guy, his name was Manilik. He was a, when he was younger, he would have dreams of how to live better, and he was just taught his village that. Mm-hmm. So my dad was doing a documentary on that, and since I have an outdoor, real outdoor family, wanted to take myself and my brothers up there, um, more my brothers than me, because I was young, and they were like, we don't want to babysit your ass, you know what I mean? <laughs> so 
I was like, let me go. So they, the second time up, took my brothers up. They went, you know, fishing and ran around the woods and saw bears and hung out in the villages. And then uh, on their way home, the pilot, I think there was a storm coming in, and he thought he could make it from um, Kotzebue. Um, they stopped and refueled, and they were heading back down Talkeetna to Anchorage. Yep. And uh, they just got off course a little bit, or he was flying too low, obviously. And one of the fingers of the Talkeetna mounds that comes out, um, they I just went and flew it three weeks ago, went to the crash site. We didn't go down in the crash site. We just flew around and found the exact spot. But flying kind of where they flew, they went right over one mountain, and it, just the angle, another mountain comes out and, and slopes down, and they just hit that mountain. Wow. Yeah. So how old were you when this? Seven. And you were your ho- at home with your mom? Yeah. And how did this play? Like, how did you find out? I, I guess my mom got a call being like, hey, the plane didn't make it to Anchorage. The plane's missing. Um you know, what do you do at that, that point? Like, yeah. you kind of know something happened. And my, I was seven, and I was like, oh, they're dead. I just told my mom that. Wow. And I told her for, like, three days because they couldn't find the plane for three days. There's a storm. As the storm, you know, subsided, they took, you know, there's other people flying out trying to find it, the area. took them another day to even find the crash site. You know what I mean? So. Out of that period from then, I would guess, like, let's say, Beyond a life adjustment, right? You know, your mom is in emotional state, and you're trying to figure things out. Like, well, what do you remember? Are there things that stick out the most from... My mom's a tough cookie. She's super Christian. She's like, oh, you know, whether God will provide or, you know, what's tough for her. Obviously, she lost her husband. She lost her two sons. And then she has to be the mom and the dad, like, trying to punish me as a boy and I'm a tough, was a tough cookie then, you know what I mean? So I know that she had a lot of support and a lot of friends and people from all over wanted to help her out. I remember we had friends that I think they came and lived with us for like a year and helped my mom out and they had kids and I was pretty much like, you know, you're not my mom, I'm not going to listen to you. The other people, like or the other lady living with my mom helping us out. So maybe that was good. I just didn't want to listen to anybody else. I had a hard time listening to my mom alone. You know? <laughs> I listen to her now. We're very close. We've, we've been close, you know, my whole life. But uh, I don't know. You know, I, I give a lot of respect to her for uh, keeping everything together you know, and uh, raising me and my sister. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, when you div- I'm divorced and dealing with two small people. But I have a fantastic former wife that deals with them half the time you work right. together at it when you lose your spouse especially and then lose two of your kids right. the the emotional impact of that is huge and then you so you went back up there this last year and what did you feel like flying over that spot like you know is there pain associated with it is it is it a, a bit of a relief is it more curiosity like what was going through your mind well we went up there in the year 2000 so this happened in 90 in 2000 went up there crash site was still there just moved down the mountain hi- took a helicopter land and hike up to the crash site the prop is there um you know there's it, some people went up obviously got the bodies and luggage and stuff like that and my brothers were bringing knives back for me and and stuff. Oh. The handles are burned. Wood, wood handles. Some of the handles are burned and stuff. I have them to this day. But uh, 2000 went up there, checked the crash site out. The people uh, in the village north of Kotzebue wanted this little, they, they built this little metal airplane, and it's actually above on top of the mountain with wow. my brother and dad's names uh, welded into it. So that's all we could see this last time I flew it. The goal is to get up there and get that prop. It's uh, There's three blades on that prop. It's all mangled. I, you know, I held it in my hands one time in 2000. I don't know why I didn't take it then. If I didn't have the option. So that was it, you know, kind of a goal last year. I wasn't able to. It's a goal this year. I'm going back up there to hunt the 26th of August. If I can get up there a week early, I might do it. I'd like to make something of it, like take my mom, my dad's best friend, take some planes out land, go get it, you know, film it. It's kind of a cool project. I think it would be, yeah. It's just the logistics of it, and I'm going to be gone, you know, a whole month if I do that, and I'm hunting. But I went up there. We flew it. The location... Uh, FAA location crash site is the Talkeetna Airport, so they don't even have the exact location. So I'd map study, and I was within, you know, six, seven hundred yards. Wow. Of it, just map studying on Google Maps. Sure. You know, so we found, we th- there was still a little snow, you couldn't see the crash site, but that little plane on the mountainside we saw within ten minutes of getting up there in the mountains where I thought. And then um, there's some Pavlov pilots, some Blackhawk pilot guys up there that are flying it while the snow melts to make sure they can see it wow. for this fall. Yeah. That's it was cool. A- it was cool, man. So now you, you'll hike back in with a group? Yeah, so I have a, another buddy who's a pilot. He's going to fly it and see if there's a place to land within a mile. 
with the plane. Originally, I was just going to get some um, heli- hire some helicopter guys to go up, but I have buddies with planes, so they want to be a part of it, which would be pretty cool to try to get uh you know six seven those with the pilots up there and fly in, then hike up there, get the prop, check it out, hike back out, yeah, the prop on the plane, yeah. Head out. Now I think I think it's something that you should definitely document, right? Yeah. I mean, for you, for your kids, one day. Yeah, it'll be good, cool for my mom. For your mom, yeah, yeah. yeah. So as you as you grew up, like, how did you observe your mom in in dealing with this? Like, you know, you're seven is one thing. When you're 13, it's a different thing. When you're 19, it's a different thing. What what were your observations? She's been, uh, I mean, she's always been the same with it. You know, she's always like, you know, it's heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, she's never gotten remarried, never dated. She's like, that was the love of my life, you know. Um, I wasn't okay with her dating. I was like, I'm going to kill him if you, you know, <laughs> you're my mom. You know, but now as I'm older, I'm like, you know, if you want love, like, you know, find it. But yeah. she's not interested. Um, she's always been the same. She's like, just puts her faith in God and prays about everything and is like, you know, prays. She has a big prayer list, and I'm on the top of the prayer list all the time. If my friends have needs, she's like, you know, let me know their names. She'll put them on there, and she's just solid. Yeah. She's 72 years old. She goes and walks two, three miles a day, and she's has a huge garden. She's vegetarian unless I hunt something and I make, like, you better eat this. I hunted it. She's like, okay, fine. Time to buy it. <laughs> You know, that I mean, she's a full life in, in yeah. her own way. She has a full life, yeah. right? Which yeah, she good. does. She travels. She does. You know, she kind of continued what my dad was doing and doing like religious history documentary stuff and just interesting stories. Um, so she continued doing that. She does that to this day. She has a small nonprofit, and she gets invited, you know, around the world to do talks at churches and stuff like that. Still, so she'll travel to Australia, New Zealand, and wow, she's adventuresome still. That's good stuff. That's good so. stuff. So w- did you play sports, or what did you do when you were growing up during that period of time? Uh, I just ran around the woods. I skateboarded a bunch. I dirt biked. I BMXed. Or, I didn't, you know, I didn't play any sports. I thought I did. I thought I wanted to for a little bit, and I realized skateboarding was way more fun. So. Yeah. It's, it's funny because you get getting team guys in here in two buckets, right? There's, yeah. like, the stick and ball guys, or they swam, or they yeah. were involved in, like, you know, very regimented athletics, right. and then you get guys that are just fucking yeah. savages. Well, right? I went to, <laughs> funny, funny you say that, uh, well, my freshman year in high school, my sister, older than me, she's been, she's pretty stringent, very Christian, which is great. She's a little extreme sometimes for me, and uh, she went to this boarding academy in, in like, Pasco, Washington, and it's like an extreme place, and, uh, you know, it's like, my mom's like, oh, you'll love it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. So I get up and it's like, you know, guys and girls, they can only sit together at certain meals and they're like, I mean, it was like, it was just, it was just stupid. And I was sneaking out and like met a girl, sneaking out, seeing her and stuff. And like, I got kicked out of that place. You know, <laughs> oh wait, that was, a, yeah. So my fresh, yeah, yeah, that was my freshman year. Got kicked out. Sophomore year, my mom finds another place in California and similar style. Way too extreme for me, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, she's like, man, this place is awesome. You're going to love it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like the last place, you know? And she's like, oh, it's different. It's not, you know, it's, the, it's not that bad. You know, I was like, okay, we'll see. Got kicked out, you know. Two B- for two. BB B- B- Gun Wars had a, had a senior that I fell in love with. And they put us on social because we are hanging out. Like, you hang out too much. And, like, freshmen in high school, what do you, I think about girls all the time. And I would love to have a girlfriend, you know? They're like, nah, you hang out too much. So, so we got put on social, right? And so then we had Christmas break. So we just met up at Christmas break and spent Christmas break together. And they found out about that and wanted to punish me. And I'm like, yo, that's for doing my time off. You can't, yeah. you can't punish me for what I do when I have my days off. <laughs> so they did and picked me out of that one, too. Three for three? You got that was two. That was two. So then I just finished up my high, uh, high school uh, sophomore, junior year up in Angwin, a small town. There's a preparatory school at the college at Pacific Union. And then... My senior year, I wasn't getting along with my mom too well, and I was actually always a good kid. I wasn't out drinking at night, doing drugs, something like that, but I would want to stay at my friend's house. I'm a senior in high school, like, get good grades. I was running a lot because I wanted to be in the SEAL teams, and uh, just wasn't getting along, along with my mom the best, so she's like, oh, man, there's this place I know of. Wow, three for three, my mom. How could I trust that anymore? Um, she's like, there's this big ranch in Montana, really good people. I know them through this other person. You can go up there and work, and I'm like, oh, ranch in Montana? That sounds awesome. I love the outdoors. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I quit my senior year, moved up there. Um, 
it was terrible. It was like in the middle of it, it wasn't Western Montana, which is beautiful. It was like outside east of Billings, just total shithole. Ground is frozen. You know, you dig like this much in July, and that's it. The ground's frozen under that. Cows, sheep. The owners of the ranch are just. The lady was nice. She was scared of her husband. He was trash. Um, but I and did, you're working there. I, yeah, I was like so. I was, you know, burning the fields for them to till, and I was feeding the cows in the morning, and my job for a good amount of time was, um, well, feeding sheep, and then I'd have to go up. So if sheep have babies in the evening or night, they die and they freeze. So if they have babies in the morning, and they can eat enough, and they're strong enough, and they dry off, that they'll be in the pack and they're, they're good to go. So I'd pick up dead baby lambs every morning, and I had a four-wheeler and this little cart on the back of the four-wheeler with a little pole pin where you can lift, and it's a little dump dump cart. Yeah. And there was, like, an area with a hill that I dumped the dead baby lambs off of every morning. I picked up, on one morning, I picked up 168 dead baby lambs. In wow. One morning. Yeah. Science of the Lambs has got nothing on me. No. Know. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's got to have an impact even at that age. I took my skateboard. I had to, you know what's messed up is I had, like, a Discman, like a Sony Discman, and I had two CDs, and I forgot one of them. The other one was, uh, like... Uh, chocolate starfish in the hot dog flavored water like Fred Durst <laughs> <laughs> and I was like I forgot the other one it was just terrible and that's all I had to listen to for like three and a half months I was like this is while you're picking up that animal I stayed positive I took one camera like little clip Kodak <laughs> camera every picture I have of everything my fingers in front of like this the entire camera like 24 photos you know but I I worked out every night I stayed positive I was just like these people suck but I know something's better out there, you know. Um, the cows, I made friends with all the young bulls. You know, I talked to them, named them all. My only friends up there. Got out of that place, though. So when you went there, the g- you, you left high school midstream senior yeah. year? Yeah. And you went there. You, what got you interested in the teams? And, like, how did you even find out about it? Uh, like, sixth, seventh grade time frame. Uh, my mom's cousin, Ethan, got me, like, a Navy SEAL workout book. So I had that book. I was like, wow, this is cool. Um, looked through it, and uh, just that stuck in my mind. So during high school, I went back to it. and was like, cool, look up the different special operations and what they do. It was like, I mean, how how do you not want to go skydive into some enemy country at night and smoke them? Sure. You know? And this was roughly what year when, when you went to Montana? Um, that would have been, shoot, I guess 2000-ish time frame. So pre nine eleven, you know, yeah. it's after the first first Gulf War. So there's still yeah. stuff going on, but it's not like not like super kinetic. So take me from Montana to you going into the Navy, and how did you how did you enlist, and what was what was your goal? What did you sign up to do, and then what was the fallback? Um, so finished Montana, came back. I was like, well, that was stupid, but I learned a lot just about grit. You know what I mean? Uh, not liking where I'm at, but just being like, hey. Time continues, this, I'll get through it, you know. Were um, there kids your age, by the way, there? No, it was like this old dude, his wife was scared of him. They, like, make during the evening, it was never enough food. They had a son who's, like, mid to late 30s who lived somewhere else, so he came in to help at the ranch. This is how just stupid some humans are. You know Archie, the little books, the little comic books? Yeah. So it was a bunch, I was, like, downstairs in, the, like, the basement room. There's two rooms down there. It's freezing cold. I had 19 blankets, you know. And I in the other room, there's all these Archie books, so I took them into my room so I could you know, read Archie at night. The son, you know, came home. He's like 35 to 40, and he comes to help on the ranch for like a month. They were his books growing up. He took every single one of them and wouldn't let me have it. <laughs> He's fucking 38 years old, you dumb, like, yep. you fucking child. Yeah, St- like, steals you know, all the Archie like, books. real cool, dude. Like, I want him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stupid. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There's some weird people out there, guys. There there uh, are. Anyway, got out of that place, uh, came back, uh, Went to St. Helena High after that to finish up. I only had, like, three classes to do, so I just went to EMT school, got my dive, like, scuba dive license, r- worked. I'd run to work, um, run back, I'd run everywhere just prepping, you know, to go to the SEAL teams I already wanted to. Um, so once I graduated there, I went went down. I'd already signed at MAPS, went to boot camp, you know, passed my scores in boot camp. Where uh, was boot? Boots up in Great Lakes. Okay. And then... Back then, you had to pick an, an A school, like an MOS. So go to boot camp, do your test to qualify to go to special special programs or go to go to BUDS. Then you go to that school where, ev- where everybody learns whatever they're going to do to go to the fleet. And once you graduate that, 
everybody goes to fleet, you go and show up to SEAL training to budge. So yep. I did that. Started budge, went through uh, first time, every time, all the way through. Then uh, checked into Team 5. Great platoon, got disbanded. It was a little wild. Uh, yeah, with Kevin Kent. Um, then deployed, went to Iraq, uh, which was great with Team 5. Came back for a little while, you know, a lot of good schools. Just there's so much fun in the SEAL teams. There's so much stuff that you're always busy, you're always learning, you're always challenged. Um, there's always cool schools to go to, driving schools and breacher schools and sniper schools. You go to skydiving, you're doing so much cool stuff. And, you know, gunfighting schools. You don't realize it. I realized once I get out, like all those schools on the civilian side, like cost so much. And you're like, wow, I really got to learn more than most people ever get to do in such a short period of time. In and multiple lifetimes. It, right. Yeah. So you know, I did another deployment in Southeast Asia. Came back from that, ended up getting in a little trouble for fighting way too much, and then uh, went to Team One and uh, hopped in with some really good leadership there, and went went to Afghanistan, which was a pretty cr incredible deployment. That was 2009-10. Um, came back from that, went over to a training detachment, so I ran all the uh, maritime operations for the SEALs coming through to get them ready, the platoons ready to go overseas. So I'm rewinding back to the beginning of this. So were you in? Team 5, when 9-11 happened? Where were you when 9-11 uh, happened? Nine, I was right before I joined. It was right before you joined. Yeah. So you already had made the decision, and that just was like... Yeah, I was already on my... I wish I had... I wish I had thanks, Mom, for making me quit. You know, my senior year telling me I didn't get along with her, you know, making me go to Montana. I <laughs> would have gone in a year before. I'd, I had actually had a close buddy who grew up down the road, friends with uh, our family growing up, uh, Derek Benson. He joined a year before me, uh, went out, went to Dev Group, and then he died in Extortion 17. So who knows, you know, I, I, I don't regret when I went in just because it, all those little ideas like, oh, I should have came, came in a year earlier. You don't know, I might not be sitting here. You yeah. know what I mean? So well, it's very, very true. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to rewind you to going through BUDS. Uh, how many people are in your class? What class were you in? Uh, 246 was uh, my BUDS class. And we have, I think we had 186 or so that were sp slotted to show up. Some people didn't even show up. People start quit before there, and I think we graduated uh, 19, 19 originals, maybe 22 originals at the end of SQT. Wow. And any chance, or did you get to a point where there any things were tough? Like there's some guys that are like, it was cold, or I had issues with water, or pull-ups, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it was miserable. It was kind of fun. Like, uh, there's, you know, majority of the guys that are the best dudes who make it. Don't even think about quitting. It's just another thing you have to do. And you're so worn out, and it's funny. You're freezing ass cold, and you're just like, oh, yeah, this is... F you can laugh. You're like, what more can you do to me? It's like, miserable is kind of funny. Right. You know what I mean? And it's and you're with your buddies. You're like, I'm not quitting on my buddies. Yeah. You know, like, if you could do it, I could do it. Fuck you. Were there guys that you thought would make it through that didn't? Yeah. And then there's guys who made it through that shouldn't have. You know, like, guys who barely make the times, and... And I was always on the, like, I was like, yo, quit. I was telling people to quit. You know what I mean? Like, you're ruining it for everybody else. Like, this is the most elite group of people. Like, I feel like, I felt like going into it, I was going to be the, the slow one. You know, I thought I would be the one. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I crushed it. I'm glad I prepped for it. I'm glad I was skinny. I'm glad that I had prepped well enough that my body could take it that beating and heal pretty quickly. Because that's what really breaks guys down. Their body's not healing enough day to day, day to day uh, with the, just the constant beat down workouts, everything. So I'm glad I was just lean. I could run good, swim good. Everything else comes after that. It was interesting. Tom Dietz was in here, and we were talking to him. And you have known him for quite a while. And he was talking about some guys that had quit. And he, he looked at me, and he said, I'm like, well, what did, what did you think? You know, what, when these guys quit, he's like, I want them to get the fuck out of there. And yeah. that's what I told him. And I was a little shocked, right, because it's just shocking from him. And as a civilian... You know, we're we're in a society now where you're always encouraging, 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 and sometimes, you know, like when we race cars, people would say ASB, and I'm like, what the hell is that? And I'm like, another sport beckons, right? And there were yeah, people that you're better somewhere else, go away. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. especially a team built, a, a, a team oriented. Like if you're, you, if you suck, like you, there's team oriented. You make the team better by being very good yourself. Take that responsibility on that. You carry your weight and some. Be good at everything you do. Work work on it, right? Physically fit, mentally there. You really, if you just suck at this thing, maybe you don't suck doing paperwork. Maybe that's your job. You know what I mean? Like, that's fine. But in that little arena, in that group, 
if if you if you're sucking, you're bringing everybody else down, and that's why they do those teamwork stuff with the logs and the boats. And I don't want someone just to barely sneak by, and then he's sneaking by because he's getting encouragement from everybody else, like, oh, you can do it. You know, the guys would go. There'd be a time limit. I cut off, and guys would run back and run with the guy, like, come on, you can do it. And I'm like, what are you doing? Say you can't do it. Don't go run with them. Like, right. don't, what are you doing? Like, you want that guy on your platoon later when it really comes, push comes to shove, and you got to run 20 miles, and you're in firefights? That's the dude? You're not going to, like, everybody should be able to do 110%, 10% more for your buddies, you know, and you don't want that dude scraping by. Sadly, I think more dudes scrape by than not in the teams, especially with the huge push to get as many guys in there. Sure. In, the, you know, the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah, when it's hitting the fan. So there's no time during that period that you thought you were going to quit. You, you you get through it uninjured, right? And then where's the first place you go after that? Team five. I start training, start driving. We you know first thing went to the team, got my gun, my night vision, and flew to Reno, and we're doing off road driving school. Second week as as a nighttime off road driving school, and the vehicle in front of us. There's a driver, a dude in my class. There's a dude in the turret from my class, and uh, there's a senior chief from Team Five in the passenger seat and. They're driving at night on a side hill, and he hits a rock, and they flip the Humvee down the mountainside. And uh, the dude in the turret, this guy, Alex Lee, ducks down, and he's okay, like broke his collarbone. Driver's all right. Fitzhenry gets thrown out, and the vehicle rolls over him. Oh. So we get out. We're like, boom, go white light, looking, like, find Senior Fitzhenry. His night vision had cut into his head here, all the way out here, so his head is flayed open. Like, it crushed him, you know. So me and I did CPR on him, and uh this guy Jeff helped me do CPR on him for like 45, 50 minutes till the helicopters got there, but he he uh, he never came back from that. Wow. And then three days later, you know, we're sitting at the team, and I'm, of course, they sit me next to his daughter at the wake, you know, and it's just, a, it was like a really, it's really sad. It's such a, a shitty thing to happen, but it, what a good eye opener for us checking in that this isn't like a frat house. Like, we're not, this isn't just any normal job. Like, this is for real, and the little things matter so much because it's life and death so many of the times while you're training, and especially overseas. All of that, the small things like that, like that's something that y- you wouldn't think of, right? It was a rock, or you were yeah. at a certain angle of a breakover angle, and right. you're like, ah, oh, you, you can keep going and doing this. I mean, does that does that carry over into your uh, regular life when 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 you get out of the military, whether it's business or risk f- risk assessment, kind of, or looking out for follies that you might yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, some of it's just where you sit in the restaurant, or right. But what do you see when you're in a relationship or in business? Do all of those things carry over? I I, I think so. I'd like to think so. You know what I mean? Especially that's being a brand new guy and all the things you learn over time. Um, you know, you learn a lot of good. You probably learn learn some bad behavior there too. You know, but uh. I absolutely think that that carries over, in which it should. I know some people can be like overly anxiety or in public, or you know, I think it's good. Yeah, stuff. like I think there's a very healthy hypervigilance, a very healthy caution that people can have, and sometimes it's I don't know if it's looked down on or being like, oh, you know, you're too hypervigilant. I'm like, yeah, because I like to sit to be able to see the restaurant, and I like to know where my exits are. You know what I mean? I like to have a knife on me. Right. Like, uh, look how much bad happens in the world now. Look how many guys are trained with guns and and they they don't deploy them properly or they they're in situations where they should and they and they don't. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about I want to talk a little bit about the thing that happened in Texas and um, culturally what's going on. I want to talk about those things. I want to jump back to so you go to Iraq, Team Five. Yep. Yeah, we deployed a seven, but we were a Team Five platoon. And where were you? Um, where did you get put when you were there? And what did what did you do? I was a lead driver for the vice president of Iraq for a little while, and then from there, uh, they had some some DAs out of right there in Iraq, and then from there went up to northern Iraq and did direct action and Overwatch stuff up there. Yeah. And then how long were you? Not six months, nine months. Six months. Six months. Yep. And then you spin back to Coronado, and yep. train. Was it squadron that your gets disbanded while you're? That was before deployment. That was before. Yeah. Was it your fault or was it Kevin's well, it was fault? Never my fault. <laughs> you're a victim of circumstance. Yeah, always. I don't know. It's, I was always just in the wrong circumstance. Yeah. Well. Well, you've been in the wrong circumstance with me a couple of times too. Yeah, I was always right. <laughs> Felt right. <laughs> so then Southeast Asia. Yep. Kinetic there or training. 
training people majority of the time or go look in uh, Abu Sayyaf is down there and, and they'll be smuggling guns and have training areas and stuff like that. So you're trying to find where they are. You're teaching local local military how to track and, and do vessel board search and seizure and stuff. It's a cool, cool place. It, it's amazing that uh, I was aware of it, but not to the extent. And the general public, I don't think, is aware of it at all, is when this stuff is going on in Afghanistan or Iraq, that there was stuff going on all over the globe, Everywhere. right? I Everywhere. mean, and and there's to bad the, guys. To day, you know, ISIS is prevalent in Indonesia and areas and Philippines and stuff. You know, do you think the media just does a bad job of talking about it? You know, because all this stuff's it's mainly special operations, not mil- big military right. working on this stuff. It's better that people don't know everything because they right. can't. But at the same point, I don't feel like people are uh, appreciative of what the country does or what guys like you have done along the way. Yeah, I, you know, there's there's work being done all over the world, Africa, and guys are deployed all over doing doing good work, you know. Um, one, yeah, you're right, it's good. People don't know. Out of sight, out of mind is really huge. Maybe it's it's known. You can, you can find out that, you can find out, you know, SEAL teams, Army SF is deployed all over. Maybe not exactly what they're doing. Um, I don't think it, People care to know, and that's that's okay. I mean, I think people right now they're caring, you know, how much they're spending at the pump, like how much, how how the cost of living is up. Obviously, we're gonna talk about that, but like people aren't pay- caring a whole lot past their financial burdens right now yeah. in America. You know what I mean? If the economy's doing great and we're and we're gonna go to war. You know, people, it's all over the news. Everybody knows. Now, obviously, Ukraine is big on the news, stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I think we have way more problems. I don't blame people for not being too interested in what we're doing at war or, you know, in these countries when we've got too many problems at home. Until it impacts them, right? right. You know, a 9-11 type situation right. or one of these guys right. goes, you know, not to the base. Bomber, like, yeah. There was a whole day and a half where they were like, you know, take his American, strip his American rights, treat him like a terrorist. And then four days later, it was like, oh... Poor guy. He was probably mistreated as a child. Right. You're like, dude, come on, guys. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, all these guys that were tracked down during this, that got put in Guantanamo Bay and then released, and then they're back on the battlefield yeah, killing our guys They're all guys battlefield again. commanders and ISIS commanders, and they're like, you know, trading prisoners under, you know, very poor leadership, and, you, you know, definitely... Definitely certain, you know, political leadership want, they want the vote. So they're willing to sacrifice the economy. Yeah. Obviously, they're willing to sacrifice, um, you know, peace. They're willing to sacrifice a whole lot of good in this country for that yeah. vote to be in power versus thinking about what's best for this country, first and foremost, and the people in it. Yeah. Which we're a diverse people. We're built off of immigrants and people from all over the world. But the reason we're different is because all these people all over the world want to come here and get the American dream. Now that goes away when you allow this country and people to act and be bad, like the the countries they came from, yeah, and without expecting a certain level from them of work ethic, and gratitude, and and honor and respect for where they're at and and what's around them. I think that's well stated, right? You know, you like my grandparents came here in the early 1900s because their families got slaughtered because they were Christian. By by the Turks, the United States didn't recognize that for a long time, and I understand that we needed military bases in Turkey. I'm an American before I'm Armenian, but at the same point, when you come to the United States, uh, you should be proud of your heritage. You should maintain some of the cultural things that you were involved with and that your parents and grandparents were. But at the same point, when you come to a place that's been built by generations and generations of different immigrants from different places that have invested their time, their blood, their effort. There's a million souls that were lost defending the country. And you come here and you are, you want to make it more like the place that you fled yeah, from. You, you just destroy it then. Where, how are you going to help those around you? How are you going to better help yourself if you come here and you just want to hand out? You want to give back to the society. You don't want to pay taxes. You're just taking everybody else who is working taxes. What are you doing? Stay yeah. where you're at. You know, this place wasn't better because we give handouts, but now it's becoming that because yeah. we want your boat. We want to, you know what I mean? Like, oh, you, you want have more kids, we'll just pay you more. You know, that, that's that's the opposite, you know. When when you spent how much time in Afghanistan? Six months. 
and uh, talk me a little bit through what you did there and uh, the challenges that you faced, what it was like in... Afghanistan was awesome. Man. It was pretty wild, wild west. We uh, did did missions out of Kandahar and then went up to a Ruzgan area and did uh, disruption ops, you know, went after bomb builders, um, you know, Taliban leadership and stuff like that. And it was, it was great. Sniper overwatch for different areas and people moving here to there. I mean, it was, it was cool. It was, it was wild. What did, uh, when we vacated Afghanistan and the way we did it, Kevin invested time. I'm sure you lost some friends there. Uh, the amount of effort that you physically put, the blood, the sweat, everything else. What, how did that make you feel, and how do you think it should have been managed? I mean, I think they could have done a draw, they, a, you know, a nine-month to a 12-month drawdown. I think that's what other leadership would have done. I, do, I, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty common knowledge, you know, Biden could care less about our military. You know what I mean? Um, you got to think that less than 1% of our population is in the military, so who cares about that vote when you have... Uh, those on the government subsidies that are what, 10, 7 to 12 percent, maybe more. Well, it's even more. Do you Half know the mean? people don't pay income so tax. So guess right? what? I would. Uh, who who do I want to vote? Could I, I could care less about this small group and the veteran, you know, group. I want to go for this this group of people. Yeah. So, I I just he doesn't. I don't. I don't he could care. I don't think he could care less. The administration could care less. They're like, oh, cool. All right, let's get out of there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I think it was sad how it was done. I mean, Absolutely. I know the prior administration wanted out, and that's fine. But there hadn't been a combat casualty in about a year, if yeah. I'm not wrong. And, you know, there's different ways of getting to the same end. And, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think anybody looking at that with any common sense realized that this was a rush to try to get it done by September 11th for that 20-year anniversary, and it ended up costing a lot of uh, American lives, it the makes Marines. Makes them look worse. Uh, the government. It shows that they could care less. Well, just their financial loss, right? I, I bet the, the amount of weaponry and vehicles over there could have been sold to allies outside of Afghanistan and driven sure. to these other places and sold, for as sale, opposed to abandoned, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, given to the enemy. How yeah. about that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then try to convince us that enemies, that it ain't that bad. We've been fighting for twenty years, but. Uh, they're our friends now. What okay, buddy. The people that, that helped us that got stuck there, yeah. that, you know, there were a lot of former team guys, rangers, et cetera, that went and worked with different foundations and organizations yeah. to get they're these still, people out, and they're still doing it, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but no one talks about Afghanistan anymore. It's like Ukraine now. They jump to the next big thing the media wants to put a spin on. That's right. That's yeah. right. After doing this for the period of time that you did, do you think that there's – you know, you, you said your mom's Christian. I'm a Christian person, but that there's good and evil. Absolutely. There's right and wrong. There's a big, you know, there's a big area in between, and that's, you know, that gets somewhat subjective a little bit, but there's absolutely, there's absolutely evil and, and bad that exists. Yeah. There's things that are just really harmful, obviously, out there. Uh, through your whole time at the teams, is there any one thing that stuck out in your mind? I know some of your friends, like Brad, Kavner, uh, some of the other friends that you lost along the way that you were closer with, are the memories of that? Uh, was that the? Are those the things that stick with you the most? Which which you accomplished the friendships or a combination of all of the above? Like what what when you left, what carries in your in your mind and your heart and soul from from that? Experience? I mean, all of it, I think just the time with your buddies, like being put in danger with your friends, is like. There's a lot of pressure there. I think, uh, you know, you build you build a, a deep care for buddies when you could be the one to die next or they could be um, in situations, you know, bad situations happen when your friends die, you kind of come together. Like, you carry, maybe that forces you to look and recognize relationships and those that mean the most to you uh, more. Um you value life more because yeah, I don't know. Yes and no. I value life more absolutely for those I love, but I, I think you know the callousness comes with that too. Is like you recognize that yeah, you know, death comes for us all. You can't fight it. You got to you got to do good while you're here. This little bit of time you're on earth, you better try to crush it. And um, you know, one of those big things is especially for 
guys, even, uh, buddies that are still alive or buddies that died, you don't want to let them down. You want to do well, right, in their eyes. And you want to do well for yourself. You want to do well for others. So that's, I think, a big thing that goes along with with what you're kind of asking is, I, I want to live life pretty pretty solid. I want to do well. I want to make those proud, obviously, family, stuff like that. My dad, I want to make SEAL buddies proud, ones that are alive still and ones that have also passed. You sure. Know, you don't want to let them down. You don't want to be a shit bag. Yeah. Well, I think you're doing a good job thus far from, from my perspective along the way. Um, when you got, get out, what's the first thing that you do? I mean, A, how does transition go for you? Because that's a struggle for so many people. Um, I, I, you know, broke my fingers like eight months before I got out. So I was just doing, you know, rehab for my hand. And my the master chief at the time was like, oh, just kind of make your own schedule. I was doing rehab every day. So they were like, hey, you want to stay in? You want to stay in? We do, you do, do an LPO slot. If you want to get out, you get 100%, 100% disability. Um, How bad was the injury? I don't know. I broke all my fingers. Was, that's why they're ugly still. <laughs> no amount of surgery can fix that ugly. They're in the zip code, though. I shoot a little faster with that one. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> doesn't fit in my nose, though. So, uh, y- y- I mean, you're being uh, low drama and talk about that injury, because what, what happened to your hand exactly? Um, so we were running a, a 12-man team to a ship tank down, running training, so I was running that. Uh, fast rope onto the ship, went inside, cleared it. I had two five-man groups. Um, Blackhawk comes down. We're still floating. Blackhawk flies sideways, drops a caving ladder down. Guys go out and climb up the caving ladder. I'd walk through the main ship hatch. It's like, you know, 500-pound steel door. Opens outward. I'm on the inside. Uh, I go hold the ladder for the guys going up, come back in, count my guys. Cool, five guys, boom, boom. Um, as... The helicopter was kind of flying away. They hadn't cleared the ladder yet, so I was a little worried to get caught in something on the deck. So I kind of stepped through, and then I saw it leave the ground. So I turned like this, and I went to pull my leg out, and I turned back like this, and the, no one had latched that door open. So the Blackhawk, 20 feet up, that, that rotor wash is, is heavy, got behind that door, and it was slamming on me. It was like swinging shut, like, I don't know how many miles an hour. And that's a couple hundred pound door. 400 to 500 pound steel ship hatch. Wow. So I like immediately, I just, I just pushed the wall with my hand like this against the wall and yanked my leg out back inside. But my fingers curled around the inside edge of the inside of the door. Oh. So that door just shut the inside, you know. So that was cool. So I, I was wearing gloves that were fast, that they were, um, I could fast rope with, but they were small enough to ma- manipulate my gun safety. Some new gloves from this company that testing them out. Jeff Reeves. Um, Neptunic. Yep. Is the company oh. Nap- NapTech? It's yep. called, uh, and there was Ke- Kevlar reinforced layers on this side. So, this side it just blew them all out. Uh, this side the pressure like split them all. This side it just, you know, cut them, ripped the meat down, cut all my tendons, broke all the bones. So I like cut my glove off. I was like, oh, you leave fingers in that glove, you yeah. Know? And it was just ugly and. I was like, well, fuck. So I got everybody off, and then that was the last guy. They just put the thing around my arm here and go in the Blackhawk and go and start having surgeries, you know. How many surgeries to get that cleaned up? <laughs> Three, two. Probably need some more. Maybe. Didn't you get a snake bite on that hand at the same rough time? It was it was like a year after. <laughs> so a little rattlesnake got me on the same hand. A pet. Yeah, I don't know about you that. You weren't out in the wild. It doesn't sound like a pet if it bit me, does it? That's true. That's true. You're a tame it. pet. Um, Yeah, so that happened. I was just, you know, right then there was a lull in the war. ISIS hadn't kicked off. Not a lot of operational tempo, not high operational tempo. I was, you know, a little over 10 years. I was like, man, you know, sat with some some master chiefs and stuff like that. Like, yo, that's the time frame you to commit for another 10 years to retire. You're you're 30 years old. Like, you can go back to school. You have a whole life. You know, you're going to get 100% disability. We'll do a med board. They're like, oh, go do a med board so you get your retirement as well, which... Didn't happen. They screwed me there, so my paperwork's back in. But uh, so I chose to punch out. You know, got my full full medical disability and everything, which I I don't regret getting out then. Like I said, I'm sitting here now. Had I stuck stuck around, ISIS kicked off. I may not be here. Could have got shot, blown up. There's so many so many other possibilities. And sure. I think you know, um, I started a brewing distillery. Just had some really terrible business partners with that, and they tried right to steal when you got out. Right. Yeah, I tried to steal everything. During that time frame too, I was working up doing some advising for Michael Bay. In the movies, um, just got to a point with those business partners being so dishonest that you know I stepped away from that, and uh, I didn't really, I didn't want to live in LA. I really liked the outdoors. I liked hunting, still like fishing, you know, and uh, like I didn't, I didn't want to live in LA. 
you know, I have some really good friends up in that industry. I still work up there here and there on movies, but uh, it kind of dawned on me one day. I was like, you know, I remember grinding knives with my older brothers. I love the outdoors. Um, I've always been an end user, you know, hunting and stuff too. So I was like, man, I know it works. So I just started researching steel and grinders and the best steels for, you know, from a chef using one to outdoorsman to a tactical knife. And I use knives on all those fronts. So being an end user has been the biggest blessing. And so I was like, man, started making some knives for my steel buddies. They're still active. So I got a grinder, got steel, started drawing stuff up and just started making them. And I started a social media taking pictures of the process and my learning process. And uh, it's just under the awning in the backyard. And that just started growing. And I had a plastic table in my living room with a piece of tape with the person's name and the knife sitting there. And I'd be working on it, finishing the knife up. And I had enough love and support then that people uh, were like, hey, can I get one? And I had, you know, I sold all 50. And I got uh, one of the first yeah, ones. I yeah, think. they all, I mean, it's so crazy with the lion on it, numbered one through 50, and hired my roommate, hired my other buddy, built a little shop in my backyard, hired my other buddy, and just kept going, you know, new knife design, new knife design, boom, 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 and it's grown, uh, you know, it's almost doubled every year um, the last three years, which is great, a lot of different, you know, it, it's a tool at the end of the day for me, I'm not a knife nerd, I'm not really a knife collector, I have some cool knives, but I use them. You know, generally, actually, I'll, I'll make a few for myself. I'll go use them on a hunt, and then I like give them away to the guide or my buddy's kid or something sure. like that. And and uh, I'm always striving to make the best stuff. And being the end user, like I said, has been the biggest blessing. You know. How many knives? I mean, are you guys pushing out now? I mean, all of these are beautiful. I mean, it's halffaceblades.com, right? Yeah. And you're doing everything from hatchets, tomahawks, yeah. knives, folders. Yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, as of now, it'd be, it's good, you know, weekly. Generally, we were finishing stuff stuff up and getting them out. Well, after two years, I, I hadn't done a website in the first two years, and it was just such a demand. I was like, man, you know what we should do? We'll take customer orders, and then let's do a website and make what we want to make and just put on the website, too. And that demand grew so much that just by how we work, the end of the week, we finish up knives more than the beginning of the week. So it came down to just putting them out every Saturday at noon. And that's been that way now for, you know, two, three years is we we work on knives all week. Everything we finish by Friday, get pictures of. We put on the website to go live at 12 p.m. Pacific time every Saturday. We still take custom orders, so I have a team that just works on custom orders, which is probably a year and a half wait list. Wow. At all times. And you have celebrities, musicians. I mean, give some examples of the people that buy these. I mean, I mean from... Making knives to Secret Service to Special Operations to, you know, Joe Rogan and Ozzy Osbourne, Ed O'Neill to, you know, it's it's pretty endless. You know, we built some really cool relationships and friendships. There's a group that on Facebook that started HFP Enthusiast, and it's such a wild, fun group. You know, it gets a little, little crazy sometimes in there, but uh, people, like, join together, and uh, they buy, sell, and trade, and someone needs a knife, and they get a knife, and they'll raise money for foundations and charities, and it's it's a cool group, man, you know, and they take care of each other. So we uh, those friendships built, and that loyalty has been really cool, and these people in the secondary market and the primary market, our support has been so big that now we're in, you know, we have a 4,200-square-foot shop. I got, I think, 32, including myself, at the shop being able to provide jobs. Half the guys, have, if not more, ex-military guys. Yep. Um, it's been, you know, it's been really pretty incredible to see the growth and the support and just a network of word of mouth. Um, and it's also allowed me, you know, mentally health-wise, mental health-wise to be around buddies all the time and working sure. all the time, using my hands. And also, you know, fishing, hunting, it provides a means for me to get out there and I get to use my knives and go, go to Alaska and go elk hunting in Colorado with people and, and, um, you know, uh, do all the things I love to do that keep me sane and healthy, and and I get to enjoy it, and I get to s- support other foundations and, and charities now with, with knife stuff, a lot of raffling auction or donating them. So. What, um, one of the things I've noticed as a civilian, um, but that everybody in my family is in the military, I think you've met some of my, my father, my father, before he passed away, my uncles, everybody was in the military. And one of the things I've noticed in the in the SF community, Air Force guys, MARSOC guys, Rangers, team guys, some guys migrate through the transition 
smoothly and other guys struggle. And I know when yep. you initially got out, you got involved in a distillery slash restaurant and the deal kind of turned to shit. Um, and it was a struggle and it's like, okay, what do, what, what do I do next? And you go from, I got a mission, I have limitless resources on the tip of the spear. I'm with guys that think like me and I'm doing this for country, my buddies, my right. family. Right. And all of a sudden you're out and you're like, I just got screwed by these guys. How do you keep going through that? And why do some guys get stuck? I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. You know, you go from being, having this pretty incredible job and responsibility in the military, holding this, this very big level of responsibility, right? Life and, and death. You know, yeah, and your buddies all of a sudden when you get out, you're just, you know, I don't want to say a nobody. You're a civilian. I don't think that, of, you know, civilians. But you go from that level of responsibility hey buddy, to, uh, I got my, uh, my puppy here, <laughs> um, to being, uh, you know, obviously I'm not saying civilians are nobodies, but that's how you feel, you know, and you, like, don't have that purpose anymore in you're like you don't have responsibility anymore out like at that level, and it's like I think that affects guys uh, quite a bit. And then financial stress is obviously a big thing. You know, had I been married with kids and been res- had to be responsible for that, that probably would have pushed me to go contract pretty immediately. Versus being able to I have roommates and I can live off of my, you know, three grand a month, um, you know, disability pay. Sure. I can, I can eat ramen. I don't have kids to feed. You know what I mean? So yep. that's pretty. It, that's it's much easier to start a business and and struggle if you're not trying to find you know the means of living for your wife and kids and paying for school and stuff like that for them. So I was able to really crush it and uh, start another business because I didn't have those other responsibilities. Guys get into business, they do well. Guys can go back to school. I think that biggest thing, that mental thing, is going from feeling Im- or being important, being valued, valuing yourself to being. And nobody, as in, you don't feel valuable. You don't have that responsibility, and you're not important anymore, right? Yeah. Did it? Um, f- did you feel, and do you think peop- other guys feel that they're in a dark spot, or do you think that they feel like it's starting over? And is there is it a mental thing? Is it? it w- what What do you I think? There's multiple reasons. I think, like I said, you go from being important and valued to not. Yeah. Right? And now. Now, I, I think civilian life is tougher than military life any day. I think you have structure. You know what you need to do. You know what you need to accomplish to get to the next rank, to get to the next platoon. You know what you need to do. It's structured. It's there. It's up to you. Yep. In the civilian world, you have to build your own structure, and that's really tough for guys. And you have to push yourself, and you have to motivate yourself. And motivation is tough if you have depression, right? And you have depression because you don't feel valued, and you don't feel um, needed, or you feel discarded, or, you know... Some people feel they're owed, although my opinion is it's a volunteer. You know, I think they are owed, but it's also volunteer. Sure. So it is what it is. Knowing um, what you know now, somebody that's stuck in that space or approaching that, what, what advice would you give them? I would try to get out and stay busy immediately. Keep your hands moving. Keep doing something. Um, I would just stay as busy as possible. I think that's the best thing. When guys are not staying busy and they're drinking too much, obviously drinking is a downer. Um, if you're not setting some goals for yourself, even small things, I think having more responsibility is better than less to keep your, your brain going, you know, yeah. keep yourself happier. Everybody, you know, that I know has battled some depression, both civilian side and, and of course, military guys with, you know, brain injuries and stuff too. So, you know, there's plenty of things out there that are good for your brain and staying active mentally and physically is you know, the two best things. Yeah, no, I think that that's good advice. And, There'll be one person listening to this that gets moved along listening, yeah. right? You got to stay important. challenged. I feel like if you're not learning, you're you know you're dying. Yeah. You know it's like. Yeah. So every day's a wasted day, right? Yeah. yeah. Every day's a wasted day. Um, when when you started the the knife company, I think I met you right after you were starting in your backyard, right around there. Yeah, if not before. It was even before, because I, I think it, it was probably before. Yeah, it was 2000. 12, 13. Yeah, I started in the 2012. Yeah, so it was even before. Yep. And I was just shocked at, hey, you watch some YouTube videos and using something that even the initial knives were fantastic, but now when I look at them, they're like functional pieces of art. Because a lot of times you'll go and you'll see some guy buy some crazy 1911 pistol and you're like, I'm never going to use that fucking thing, right? Or 
Uh, then you buy something, it's like, okay, it's just strictly function. It's a Glock, right? right? It's like, oh, yeah, you know, love the Glock 19X, but pure function, right? Yeah. You, you love it because it's perfection, but it, there's no emotion to it. Where right. your stuff kind of encompasses both. Yeah. And I don't think there's any two that are exactly the same. Maybe the folder's a little bit, yeah, but the other production, you know, if we do production stuff, but custom side, especially when people choose what they want. You know, if you grew up in the Redwoods, you want Redwood, you know, we just... We had a, a knife we did recently that had a mother and father's ashes in it. Wow. So we engraved these hearts or um, did these hearts out of the wood and then put their ashes and they were, the hearts were facing each other like this. We put the mom and dad's ashes in each ones for their kids. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so we've done human ashes, working dogs, guys' pets. Um, we've done, all, you know, birthstones. We've had... Just got a video the other day of somebody cutting their baby's umbilical cord with the knife. Like wow. Just really cool stuff. That's great. You know, and guys great using stuff. them overseas, too. Like I said, the wildest, you know, uh, just it gets wild. You know, when people want, and we're like, oh, how can we do this? Cool meteorite in it. Yeah. And, you know, the biggest goal is to make it uh, quality and functional. And we'll do some swords and cool shit like that because it's a challenge for us and it's really fun. But 90% of everything is all very function driven. But sure. we can make it as simple. Or as extravagant with quality pieces and quality materials as, as somebody wants, or as what we want. You know, when you were doing the the showbiz stuff, um, how did you get into that? Like, what was the first thing that got you apart? I think uh, there's a an old time team guy, Harry Humphreys, he's an old uh, Vietnam frogman who used to work up there, and he was connected with Michael and advised on Michael Bay's films. So Michael needed has been using team guys, really likes team guys for a while before I got involved. Me and Kevin Kent, and I forgot who else, went up and did some over, like, background voiceover stuff for Transformers 3. Yeah. And then that's when I met uh, Michael Bay, and, you know, we kind of hit it off a little bit. And then I worked on 4, and then I worked on 5 as well. Did more stunts on 5 and than anything. And then through that, through Harry, I met, I'd rather, you know, do stunts than just do background sure. extra stuff. And so I met um, another guy, Garrett Warren, and I started working with him a bunch, and he's a stunt. You know, he's been a stunt man his whole life, and he's a second unit director, stunt man director. Um, he's done like you know, the Avatars and Logan and stuff like that. So I worked on Logan with him. I've been on Avatar two and three since 2017, which is rad. Doing stunts, I play a role. I'm a bad guy in there, and then uh, you know, ad advising for Jim Cameron, which has been really cool to work on that. Was it um, unique in that when you guys did the 13 hours movie that a, for Michael Bay, that was pretty unique. And B, uh, it was about two guys that you knew that yeah. were lost in a combat situation, even though they were contractors. Yeah, that was a really cool movie to do. You know, to try, you know, try to make it realistic, representing the guys. I stunt doubled the main actor who played Ty in the movie. You know. Yeah. And then obviously did, you know, advised on it with the rest of the guys. Lived in Malta. Um, played one of the Delta Force guys that comes in um, and and handles the bodies of Ty and Glenn on the roof. It was it was it was it was a, such an honor to do that. Ty was our class proctor in SQT and, and he's the one who gave me my seal trident wow. actually. And then I yep. stunt up with the guy who played him in the movie. Yeah, I mean that. Who knew? Who knew? Right? Yeah. I mean, wild. And as you're doing it, um, yeah, you know, friends. At the time in the teams when that happened, and we took a couple American flags, we'd fold them up and put them in our race cars because it just didn't feel like people were paying attention. Yeah. And there were obviously a lot of surrounding circumstances to what happened in Libya that have just been blown by in terms of, uh, you know, why why was that ambassador there? Accountability. You know, yeah. There was a lack of accountability. Um, it, normally, the United States moves heaven and earth. It's one of the only countries that'll send a thousand people to rescue one, one, and the bad guys will send a thousand people to kill one person, right? And we left people there um, until it was too late. And I think yeah. the movie did a great job of explaining, in, in the movie terms, right? right? And you got two hours, you got to make it's it entertaining, in right? And you got to explain to people that don't even know that it was real to people that are studies of what happened, right. and you got to make it accurate. But the things that were going on in the world. At that time, um, we we had, we had taken these flags, we put them in the cars, and uh, one of the guys running the teams here had taken the flags and given them to the the parents. And uh, we were leaving the premiere at Texas Stadium, yeah. and someone said, 
uh, somebody wants to say hello to you. And I turned around, it was Tyrone Woods' father and his brother. And kind of got a lump in my throat. I didn't really yeah. know what to say. And it's like, I'm not worthy for you to even say thanks to me. And he's like, I appreciate what you guys did. And we didn't do anything. You know, y- y- your son and his friends and all of the people that were here um, – that did the real thing to that to the hero. I'd put a flag in my race car and drove around. We just recognized yeah, it. Yeah, that's a rec- recognizing is 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 great. That's what that's what we should be doing. You know what I mean? And out of sight, out of mind. And everybody gets busy. Everybody has their own struggles. You know. And I don't blame people for not thinking about um, those who died for them or the country all the time. You know what I mean? Like I have tattoos with buddies who died's names because I don't. I, not that I'll ever forget, but I like to be reminded. Sure. To be a have gratitude and I'm down or I'm upset about something that's minuscule compared to the death of a good man who would have died for me or did die for me or this country or my friends or the fact that I'm in a good place in business and right now uh, is is out of my effort and my team's effort and the effort that my buddies put in while I was in the SEAL teams and my lessons I learned from them has built me where I am today and it, it takes more than one. I'd have never done this alone. You know what I mean? This is why I want to share it everything with those I love and my buddies and the, my whole team sure. like to be reminded of the sacrifices guys have done to to get me where I am today. Yeah. It's, um, w- you know, once a year at least, and people think sometimes, God, why do you take your kids at a cemetery, right? We go to Cabrillo, and we roll through there, and we stop. My dad wanted his shell casing buried there, and his my mom was like, I want to get married in the Midwest, or buried in the Midwest, which I, I get. But my dad would stand up there and say, wow, you know, the sun's always on this plot. Uh, you know, I can see San Diego. I'm here with the bunch, would be here with a bunch of patriots, and yeah. I can see the the base, and I can see the ocean. Yeah. So we buried one of the shell casings there. And when you're there and you look around, there's no stone that says, this is a black guy. This is a Samoan yeah. guy or an Armenian yeah. guy, right? And you're in the sea of these stones. And I always think to myself, when I'm getting my butt kicked, and I've had the best of times and the worst of times, just like yeah. you, that... Man, all of these people had their last day so that I can pick to do whatever I want today. Yeah. And and I may pick to do nothing once in a while, but the majority of the time you got to take a step forward, step forward, step forward. And you've been a fantastic example with the, the challenges and things that have gone on. I'm extremely proud of you. When you're in business, though, and you get down to granular business, everyday business, what's the toughest thing? Is it people? Is it growth? Is it what you I mean? What do you find the biggest challenge for you? Well, I guess it depends on what's going on in our economy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, we've had a lot of people copy us, you know. Uh, we've been a great influence on others. This is kind of something that I've kind of been facing more recently and figuring out how best to to protect branding. Mm-hmm. And you can't just copyright everything. You can't trademark everything, you know what I mean? Um, it's nice to see people out there doing somewhat copying what we do and the aesthetics and everything it's awesome i think we've been a really you know big influence um uh, in the knife world just by happenstance that i'm an end user and i like to make knives and uh, and we have like this far reach with the business luckily um well by word of mouth um you know being original um purpose driven Mm-hmm. Is, is obviously extremely important. Um, being creative and looking at our future and what's going on in the world and uh, being able to pivot uh, from what works now to before it's too late to what what's the future going to hold in six months? What's going to hold in a year for us in this business? Are we that important that people... Is this a need? Is this a... Uh, you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, being able to see something that's coming and pivot to changing our ways a little bit or preparing for something is so key. Um, you can not, you don't always grow. You know, you can level off. You can go down. So knowing that, and I've always kind of, because of getting screwed over in that first business, I've always taken smaller business steps and baby steps. I don't owe anybody. Sure. You know, I've never taken more than a, a loan out than for like a CNC machine, which yeah. I, I can pay off early, you know. So... Um, thinking about what the future holds and, and having good mentors. You've been a mentor of mine for a long time, and it, it's been absolutely I needed it many times and listened to your words of advice. Um, yeah, I think the biggest challenge is is judging what's coming and and prepare kind of for the worst and yeah. f- 
find out creative ways that you can solve these problems before they get to you, before they hit you in the face. Yeah. And one of the biggest things I want to do that, that that's a challenge and a challenge I, I gladly accept because of all the people that depend on the business, right? I like I like business. I like to grow it. I always keep my hands doing something, you know sure. what I mean? Um, but with Half Face, we have a responsibility and I have a responsibility and of uh, keeping that business alive. The amount of money goes back to our guys, to their wives, their kids, sure. the food that goes in their mouths, to paying for their gas, like same with mine, like I, I want I hold that responsibility as as a business owner and as a friend, um, and I expect a lot from those guys because each guy's input helps the next guy make money too. Sure. Puts food in his mouth, yep. right, and and builds him and gives him more knowledge. So when I have a guy slacking, you know, and a guy that's putting out 110 percent, that's not fair. Yeah. You know, so you know uh, that's a great point, right? You know, and that's the difference when people say, uh, you know. They love socialism. It's like, okay, let me ask you a question. If if you went to school and you busted your ass to get an A in a test and you study for 28 hours and the other yeah. kid just shows up and gets an F, everybody should get a C? Like, yeah. you know, it doesn't work that way. absolutely wrong. You know, there's an obligation to that. But I think competition breeds uh, innovation. You know, yeah. think about either f- nobody was really making knives that were cool looking and had a story behind them and a cool brand and were functional, like whether it was Gerber, you can get these really high-end knives, but they were just function. They, it was like a Glock, right, where, where you kind of were the first one to do that. So, you know, you already know this, but when people start copying you, it's the ultimate form of flattery. But it's managing that, right? Yeah, so, you know, I've, I, it's been something that's been on my mind and I've been thinking of, and I kind of put this out to that group, is, you know, I used to think it's flattery until it's done too much. Right. You know what I mean? And, I get there's a real Rolex and a fake. People want the real, but someone's like, oh, I'm just going to buy the fake and act like it. There is a level of flattery, and I, it's awesome to see guys that we've been a big influence to. But then there's a level of, like, dude, out of respect for us as the influence for you, copy somebody else. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. And one of the bigger issues is guys have spent so much money on the secondary market for these knives, and they're not cheap knives, and they're good knives, and people buy, sell, and trade. Those first 50 knives go for twenty to $40,000 a knife. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and other knives that go for crazy amounts. That I wish I guess I wish I had kept a few more for s- been selling for three hundred bucks. But what a beautiful blessing it is for people who supported me and I bought a knife for three hundred bucks, not knowing it was going to go anywhere. And four years later, they're like, "Oh, thirty thousand bucks, awesome!" Yeah. You know I have one sitting in my safe. One that's of the awesome. Early ones, yeah. You know, that's really cool. So getting back to it is like, hey, with that, with the group of people that want to support a business, I- I'm like, don't buy fake. It doesn't help that business as branding. I want to protect this brand for long term, for longevity, for the, my workers, for myself, for my future family. I want it to stay valuable, right? Protecting the branding is, is huge. If if I don't speak up against people that copy our work all the time, I don't want it to affect my, my business negatively, my branding negatively. I also want all these people that uh, you buy a knife that's more valuable, secondary market, I want you to keep that value on that knife. That's an investment, even sure. if it's small. Yeah. So if you go run around and you buy fakes and you're like, the same guy, let's say, has 10 of my knives and somebody copies me and he's like, oh, maybe this company will be valuable one day and you go buy a fake and that person's copying us. I, I, I don't think that's all right. You're, so you're they're even doing the people. logo and everything? And no. Make it or, but no, close enough. Just, yeah, you, 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 know, you know, like they'll change the knife design a little bit and then everything else will be the same. Sure. You know, and I'm like... You're right. There's only a few. There's only a few ways to make a knife. I get yep. it. But I, I didn't see any split handle materials before I started it. Yeah. You know yep. what I mean? I didn't see any elk turquoise no. wood stuff. I didn't Woolly see any mammoth of this stuff. Yeah, like I didn't see any of this stuff. Yeah. You know, there's some. There's incredible knife makers out there. Have been around forever, much longer than me. Been blessed to know some of them. Been an influence on on me. Um, and I, there's a few stuff that share some similarities with some of these guys who've been influenced, but not not at the level in which. Very close copying happens. Sure. Now, and you know, I don't want to sound like I'm bitching because my biggest point of this is I want to protect the van, the the branding, because I want people who've invested in this brand. I want what they've been invested buying knives and putting money into this this company to stay valuable for them. Sure. And it, if the value of the brand goes down, it affects their investment. And I've been so appreciative and so blessed by having a great team and these people who have. have bought knives for me and used them and built relationships and I, I, I care about all of it. Yeah. That I don't want it tainted by fakes and stuff like that. To sure. It. I get people are going to be like, okay, the real version is this. Yeah. But I still think there's an area in which it, people who have invested maybe shouldn't be running around buying 
knockoffs. I right. fully agree. And, and I will say one thing that will always be unique to your company and you is that you're part of the brand. Right. So uh, you're not copying that. Y- you you know. can't copy that, right? And it and it's you can't go back and say, "Hey, I'm going to the teams," or "These things happen to me," or you know. W- there's been plenty of crazy other fun things that are part of that brand. Right. It's like this love of country, but also like a little bit of a wild side mixed with outdoorsmen, mixed with, wow, right. holy shit, how do you make these things? Right. And nobody can copy and that. And the team, you know, like I said, back to the team we have, I hired my buddy who I grew up with. I hired my two roommates, my old roommates. I hired skateboard buddies, a couple of pros that, you know, I knew for a long time and their buddies. And it's like, we're in a math. And we have such a great team. What's cool is my guys, you know, you start from grinding and you learn the whole process. I don't stick somebody in one spot, which, you know, I'm taking that, that possibility that someone's going to leave and go start. We've had two guys that bailed and, you know, one guy was like, Oh, I'm going to work for my buddy in Texas. He makes knives. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah. So then he just leaves, stays in San Diego and starts his own company and copies us. I'm like, yeah. And now he's, I'm like, dude, come on, man. So he changes his stuff a little bit. But I'm like, I just paid, I just taught you and paid you for two years. Yeah. And you're going to just be like, hey, I'm moving. And you don't move and you just copy. Like, I'm like, homie, like, is there some level of respect? Like, you're lucky I can't just come over to your shot. Like, I could I just beat the living tar out of you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then you'd sue me and take what I built. So I'm like, you put me in a really hard position by copying. I taught you, paid you, took care of you. Bought you dinners, treated you nice, gave you my knowledge, and then you just go off and copy my shit. And and but let me ask so you I this: hit you in a car. In that in th- that guy, and I like the guy. I'm like, man, it's, it's, a, a, bad it's more decision. of a bummer. Yeah, it's more of a bummer. It's a bummer, right? Because I really like the guy. Yeah. I don't dislike him now. I just think it's like you're really unwise. It's just it's just dishonest. It's kind of a spit in the face. You know what I mean? But it's like, never going to be successful either, right? And he's got to live with that and deal with that, right? Of hey. Well, I had this plan. I g- I sucked this knowledge up. I should have had a head start, and then you don't get there. Well, that may, you know, one of my guys kind of called him out, like, "Dude, what are you doing, man? Change your shit." Like, and he's like, "Oh, come on, you guys are the big guys. You already make a bunch of money. I'm just trying to make a buck." Like, okay, there's a thousand other knife makers. Copy them out of just the respect. Yeah. For us, yeah. like, I didn't go run around copying other knife makers when I started. Yeah. But, you know, you're better off also. You know, a big thing is be original. Maybe take something and make it better. That's fine. Right. You know, the knife existed, yes. You know, other people use the same steel, but I came up with different ways to make the metal look different. You know what I mean? And I came up with different ways of rock work and these little things. And I'm like, you're better off longevity and success being original. Because people are going to be like, I agree. that dude's copying him and that's the original. That everyone's going to know forever. All these people that want to copy, they're not the originals. You know, but the other challenge is this. You know, somebody, I was just pointing this out, again, not, not bitching, I'm pointing this out of, of uh, pointing this out because I want the branding to stay strong sure. and have longevity for those yep. that invest in it. Um, it will. But he was like, well, yeah, I, I'm, you know, we'll just pivot and I'll, I'm always challenging myself and, and my guys learning and doing things even different, better, new, right? So that's part of the, somebody was like, well, why don't you just, why don't you just come up with new things to make it harder for people to copy you? And that's a really ignorant comment because you don't, like, Okay, I'll just come up with something new so people don't copy. Like right. within three months, someone's gonna copy. It. Sure. You know, yes, I, I ch- we challenge. We're where we're at because we're doing that already. Right. You know, we're on the forefront. Yeah, we're not gonna speed the process yeah, up, yeah. It, or yeah, not yeah. like you can speed the process. Why don't, when people copy all your stuff, why don't you just make something different that's that's better and harder to copy? It's just ignorant, you know. But we already do that. We already challenge ourselves. We're already pivoting, seeing what's coming in the business and market. And we love what we do. And we love seeing people see, using the product. Sure. So we, we do that all the time, which is, it's good. It's a challenge. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, and that drives innovation too, right? Absolutely. I mean, they're copying and they're assholes for copying, but at the same point, it drives you along and they're sure. never going to be able to keep up. The, the one thing in spite of some things like that happen that you've done a great job with is... A, diversification, I want to talk about that next, but B, you've helped out a lot of people along the way in terms of who you've hired, things you've done, um, you know, and and done doing it privately. Like I can, you know, say that I know how many people in, um, on the side, whether it's finance, whether it's with a job, whether it's with talking them up, whether it's with investing in their deal, um, that you've gone and, and helped. Like what motivates that component of it for you? I mean, look how much I was blessed by people helping me starting the business, um, buying a two, $300 knife, you know what I mean, when I was just learning. And that's gone so far for me. 
I mean, I don't need a pat on the back to try to want success and happiness for others. Absolutely. Like, who cares? You know, I, I care about their success. Like, one of the biggest things when other guys come to me, they're like, hey, I'm starting a business. How should I do it? How should I do this? Like, here's what's worked for me. Here's the first, here's the first thing. Don't give anything away for free. If any of your buddies hit you up and be like, hey, can you hook me up? In your mind, you're like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to hook my buddies up. Right? I'm like, first rule when you start a business, your buddy should buy two and give one away at full price. If that's your friend and they yeah. want to see you successful, don't fucking give anything away for free. Absolutely not. So all these, you know, these little companies, I'm like, no, I'd rather purchase it. Or if someone sends me something free, you know, I'm, I hand it back and I'll go buy two or three off the website and sure. give them away. You sure. Know what I mean? or that's good I'll, advice. I, I do it to this day. Like I'll see a company and uh, some cool stuff, and I'll be like, cool. You know, they'll send me three shirts, and I'll hop online and buy tw- thirty shirts for the guys at the shop. You know, work shirts and stuff. So that's like, I think that's the first rule. If you have friends that want to see you successful, like, buy from buy from your friends. You know, I got really annoyed in the beginning because every foundation hit me up when I'm starting. You know, retired. You know, combat veteran, disabled veteran business, and every day I get hit up by veteran charities asking for free knives. And I'm like, I got to a point. I was like, no. Well, no. you have to. And then the good ones would be like, hey, we want to buy them full price. They turn around and raffle them for two to five thousand dollars each, and you don't want to buy it for me for four hundred dollars. Sure. To help my small business grow. Right. Like screw you. Right. That's you're not even a, you're not a charity at all. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You want to you want to go and have these talks and and talk about guys who died and their kids are left with the fatherless to get people to cry and put money in your bank account, but you have thousands of guys getting out between five and twenty years trying to make a living, married with kids, trying to start a business. You want to take from them. Like you should have a foundation that simply helps them. Yeah. Pay a full price. Help them out. Help them grow. Yeah. No, you that's know? good advice. And you know it happens a lot. It happens a lot. And people see success and they and they they glom on. And sometimes when you start a company, people will look at you. And I'm sure you get this all the time. I mean, it's you're so lucky, right? And they don't know the waking up at three in the morning, you know, God, how, how are we going to pay for this? Or these yeah. things showed up and they were broken or this didn't work yeah. out right. Or this guy quit or whatever. And, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, you never get to quite walk away from that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's You're always, constantly working. You yeah. know what I mean? Luck, like, not luck. I keep saying that, but like from, from the effort of, you know, multiple people, this business has grown and the word of mouth and the input from others, you know, um, it's constant, and I it's it's like it, go on vacation for you to go hunting, and like the day before I come back, I'm like, okay, what what did I miss the whole time? What do I need to catch up on? I'm so blessed to have guys, my manager and um, and Kelsey, you know, running the business on that front, and you know, my manager for the customs and my manager for the production side, and break those teams up. We have our team meetings, and and guys are really good at what they do, and they. They love what they do, and those guys that are managers are, are they care about everything that comes out of there. It's not just a nine to five. Sure, you know and that creates you know that that they care about the product, and that's the team building side of it that's absolutely needed for success. You you have to in business, especially now. Um, the the union mentality and being successful with that doesn't work. Where the workers are separate from the management, which is separate from the company. Uh, when people say rotten things about corporations in the United States, it irritates me because first off, corporations are owned by the teachers union and an endowment fund, uh, Joe the plumber who has a mutual fund, like find a place where there's clean water every day that you can turn the faucet on and drink it out of the bathroom if you wanted or had to, or that you get on a jet plane and that we haven't had a major uh, aviation accident since 2001 that the pilots and the ground crews and the planes and all of this stuff right. is funded. And that's the greatest country in the face of the planet right. that gives guys like you or guys right. like me the opportunity to come up with right. I- innovative ideas. And find people it. to help outsourcing, you know what I mean, overseas and stateside. Like you can almost get, I mean, look what look at the technology we have now because someone's able to think it up and then engineer it and make it. Yeah, yeah. The logistics side of, of stuff is amazing. Like, you know, when I was growing this the logistics side of steel and every piece that I need and heat treating and I mean that that was big and I look at these other businesses that I'm listening to it looks like a nightmare logistics wise. Helicopters. And doing it. Yeah. 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 And it's crazy. I mean the qualified people that care. And they know. do. And they do just because you work for a big company or because the 
corporation makes a lot of money doesn't mean that people don't care. Like, right. um, well, they it also, you know, you have guys that are like, man, this business makes this much money. I think I need to get paid more. And they're like, I'm paying part of your taxes already. Like, I have to buy insurance. Like, the money isn't what you think. You know, you right. own your own business. Like, yeah, you know, when you sell it, maybe you get a, a nice little chunk, but it's, it's not like. Uh, People are just lining their pockets, owning the business. Everything goes back in to pay off. You know, the other part of it is the responsibility level to take. People should ta- get paid more for a risk level and a responsibility level. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you're taking all the risk and responsibility, oh, cool, you know, if you have $2 million bucks in debt, the guy who's in the shop complaining he's not getting paid enough isn't $2 million in debt. Right. And doesn't have 30 other guys to make sure that they're doing things properly, legally, Good quality building relationships. You know what I mean? Sure. It's it's it, rarely do I we get complaints like that because I really think that taking care of your people is is and your team is the most important. Yeah. Because they take care of you and um, picking good ones to start, right? Trying. Yeah. You know we've we've definitely had some bad seeds, but we find out pretty quick. You know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. we hire a guy and it's he's so stoked to work for a knife shop and half face looks it up and. Like cool man, you start you know start tomorrow and they're there at seven and noon they go to lunch and they don't return to lunch and we get an email like oh man this isn't for me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you probably work in the restaurant industry and you're 26. Yep. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cool. You don't. I, but walk better around, early. Not, not hard. It ain't tough work. Yeah. Sorry guys. Sorry you in the restaurant industry. I'm not saying you don't do tough work, but you don't do tough work. What about <laughs> um you? So you diversified though. I mean so I and I think this is fantastic. So we've got Kill Bad Dudes Canoe Club. And then Warpaw Wines. T- t- tell me a little about each of those three, and wh- how'd you get involved, and what do they do? Uh, Canoe Club. My buddy Ryan, who was in the SEAL teams with, started that. Asked me to be a, be a part of that with him. Uh, c- uh, ammo company out of Vegas. Okay. So we just uh, resell ammo. Yeah. Um, s- some of the lowest prices. We move a lot of ammo. It's kind of a weird market right now. Um, it's that, crazy, isn't growing. it? Yeah, yep. it's growing. You know. Um, KBD, it's just a side project kind of for fun, and because I own 100% of Half Face, I wanted to start something on the side that guys can kind of learn business, so I gave 49% of it away to those who've been with me a long time at Half Face Blades, and they can see how a little small business works, a little fun project, we do knife stuff and clothing, and, sure. you know, it's very small, and it's kind of cool, and if it, you know, makes a little money at the end of the year... You know, everybody gets a little check, and it's, it's great to not do much at all. See it grow. We can put more into it if it's too much of a hassle. You know, I think at some point, you know, the following is really cool to grow that. So once you have 50, 60, 70, 80,000, 100,000 followers, you can always pivot from that, start a different business, and just change the name. You have this following sure. already, and that's worth worth a lot. Yep. You know what I mean? So, And tell me about the wine. The I, you know, growing up in Napa Valley, and I like wine, and I like other cocktails as well. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I was, you know, I've always wanted to. Uh, I I made wine at my own home. It didn't turn out well. I made it again. It didn't turn out good again. I don't think it's ever turned out good making it in my house. But uh, I ran into a guy. He was a few classes behind me. He joined the Army. Uh, he grew up up there in Napa Valley. I married a, a woman up there. Um, got into wine. Has his own wine label. Works at a winery as a, one of the winemakers as well. Uh, and runs that. And he I ran into him. I was like, dude, I've wanted to do this for a while. Would you be my winemaker? Can you run it up here in Napa Valley while I'm gone? He's like, absolutely. So I'm his first client. He's a good dude, uh, GW. Uh, he has a wine called uh, Lucier Wines. Um, he's up there in the valley. So I went with him. We have contacts to get grapes and walk vineyards. And luckily, we ha- have both have good contacts. So I'm able to get up there and get some get some good grapes from the better areas of the valley instead sure. of just buying bulk um, mm-hmm. wine. So I released... Uh, also, you know, I, I met a guy, Brian Hughes, a uh, really good dude, has had his, he has a, uh, a wine label as well up there, and he hadn't, um, he hadn't labeled at all, so I was able to get some from him and actually have a, a red blend to come out first uh, with him. Uh, then these next wines are all from scratch with my winemaker that are coming out. So I have a, a Chenin Blanc, actually, tomorrow, 5 p.m., a Chenin Blanc goes live there's a red blend on the site and then uh pinot noir will be beginning next year and then five years will be the cab and the cab will be really ridiculous where can people buy it right now if they want it off the website just warpaw.com warpaw.com yeah wow that's pretty cool i'm proud of you it's a cool little side project yeah i think what i'll need to do uh 
eventually just kind of hire somebody to represent me. And I've got some really good restaurants asking for it. You know, uh, I just I'm so busy doing so many other things. I, you know, I run social media for all these c- companies too, and I, it's it gets a little overwhelming. How does social media has has blown your brand up, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm an old guy at at 54, and I certainly understand it and leverage it. But you know, you you have mastered it. Um, how did you learn that? Did you just learn it as you went, or you know, all I've, you know, it, again, it's a blessing that we make knives every day, and they change and they're different. So I have new photos every day. Sure. You know, that's huge. If you have the same four products, how do you make them exciting week after week? Right. You have to put them. You have to go somewhere wearing them. You have to have somebody new wearing them. You got to say something fun or corny to make people laugh right. and like your photo. I never had to do that. Yeah. And being able to take photos and videos of people working the shop, it's f- cool to see how they're made. It's gritty, dirty hands, and the end product is really cool, and it's really fun, and it and it changes daily. So I've been able to grow that simply because it's a really cool product, you know. How was it the the whole Eddie Gallagher thing got woven into your piece? How did that impact? Who knows, man. Uh, you know, I, a lot of a lot of the teams have knives and tomahawks of mine, and you know, when the NCS took his place down, they took his knives, and they even took his half face blades hat as evidence, and they took his hat. Yeah, they were turds. Uh, he got all his stuff back. You know what I mean? Good. I'm glad he got his back. stuff back. Yeah, absolutely. He was innocent. So, you know, and uh, there's been New York Times articles of, like, you know, my name in there, but there was a link to my website, and I was like, sick. So people would go through and be like, his friend, he had knives from his, his friend Navy SEAL, half face blades. And, but it, it's the little blue, and you, like, click right to the website. And I was like, ah, oh, cool. Thanks, New York Times. Yeah, thanks for the advertisement. Yeah, thanks yeah, for the advertisement. You know, I, I had been out. I had been out for... Four years, Eddie wasn't even in my platoon. He was in my sister platoon. You know, I got lumped into it because I also knew the names of the guys who were lying. Sure. Lying about him. Um, and, you know, it was just it was dumb. Just a whole fiasco. That, you know, they tried to ruin his life. And we should always go to bat for our friends. Yeah. Always. Always. You I know, don't support if they're doing wrong. Say something to them, but go to bat for them. And, and uh, people try to – people armchair quarterback, obviously, with everything. Um, especially at war, war stuff, but they're not taking that responsibility on. Yeah, and and especially when everything's out of context and the media's jading it, and then you get a prosecutor that's doing things that he shouldn't be doing, putting things in emails to track yeah. where they're going. And um, I think that the former president did the right thing and you know intervening in that process, but he was well. His intervention was only to get it, let him work with it, get him out of the break so he could work with his lawyers. He couldn't even see his lawyers, right? I mean, well, they would just take, you know, I went to visit him and they'd take me off the list. We want one, I'd visit next week. They'd have, have me off the list. Like just, they just messed with him. Like they yeah. just wanted, to, they wanted to protect the institution Yeah. and, and destroy him, you know, yeah. just yeah. for, <laughs> just nuts. When you've seen all these different things and been a party to it, I mean, there's tragedies, a young man, uh, going into the teams and seeing, you know, having triumph, tragedy, getting out, and now, you know, being extremely successful in business and, uh, you know, still being a young guy. When you look at young people today, uh, not necessarily coming out of the military, but in general, what advice would you give them in terms of, because uh, everybody's going to have resistance or friction in their life, but what what is your, there's no secret to success, but if you had a short time to and you, here, here's your chance, right, yeah. to tell somebody, hey, this is what you need to do um, to push through. What would that advice be? Um, hey, buddy. <laughs> We're almost done, buddy. I don't know. Don't You know, I, I actually did a little online interview today for, like, San Diego Magazine or something like that. Um, and when they, they make you ask they make you ask the question, like, you know, for yourself. Sure. And uh, it was kind of a similar question. It was like, you know, don't quit. Right? As simple as that is, if you can get through the little things, you know, you're always going to have bigger. Hey, buddy. You're always going to have bitter. Come on. Come on. Go love somebody else. <laughs> um, hey, you're always going to have bigger problems, right? So in a perspective, like, you know, different, some problem comes along and it seems big. Like the whole don't quit, you know, find a new way, find a way through. Don't give up. Don't let it get you down too much. Work through the problem. Um, and then when you're through it, time keeps going. It's gonna, something's going to give, 
right? Whether you try a different angle, try something else, but you're trying something else and not giving up. Doesn't work? Okay, think a different way, but you keep pushing, right? Yep. You get through that thing, something bigger is probably going to come your way in life. Something harder, something tougher, whether it's a business thing or an emotional thing or somebody dies close to you. Um, like, don't quit. It's the easy way. To, obviously, easier said than done, but really diving into that whole don't quit mentality. Um, goes a really long ways in the little things. Sure. And like I said, you you make the right decisions in the little things. You push through those small things. When those bigger struggles and trials and tribulations come, you know that you're like, I've gotten through those things. I can get through this. I can push through this. I can learn this. I can accomplish this, you know, this goal, this issue. Like I said, some of it may be a business goal. Some of it is just life's hardships, you know, financial, yep. emotional, things like that. And, uh, Simple as don't quit as, you know, you dive into it. And I think there's there's some form of success, you know, when you push through something that's tough. Yeah. You know. Well, I think you're uh, evidence to all that regardless of what happens to you as a kid, as an adult, as of your own choices or other people's choices or just happenstance of life, that that not quitting and continuing to push um, get you someplace and you just have to keep doing it even if it's looking at the very small steps to get there and I appreciate you coming and sharing today I appreciate your friendship all that you've done not only for country uh, the, the the people that work for you my kids my family um, our friendship's important but I love that you came on today to be able to share with other people um, you know Life's a battle. You get through it, and you keep working through it, and good things happen to, to good people, and that's definitely the case here. Thanks, buddy. Yep, love you, bud. Love you, too. Thanks. Oh.